And then, okay. Our mission, Helping Parents Heal is a nonprofit organization dedicated to assisting bereaved parents to become shining light parents by providing support and resources to aid in the healing process. We go a step beyond other groups by allowing the open discussion of spiritual experiences and evidence for the afterlife in a non-dogmatic way. Affiliate groups welcome everyone, regardless of religious or non-religious background. Attendance today at this meeting is voluntary, and we are here for the benefit of learning from and sharing with other parents whose child has passed away. It is understood that our discussions are intended to be confidential and not designed to replace traditional therapy or spiritual counseling. However, these Zoom meetings are helpful to parents all around the world, and they are posted on YouTube so that affiliate members who are not able to attend this meeting live can also watch. Helping Parents Heal offers a wide variety of speakers to allow parents to be informed about many possible ways to heal, to connect with their children, and to learn about the afterlife. The views expressed by our guests do not necessarily reflect those of Helping Parents Heal, and we ask that you take from their presentations whatever may benefit you personally. Thank you so much, Irene, and I'm so thrilled to have Dimitri here with us. I just want to say that I have this cast on my hand and I'm, I did a stupid thing. I just started screen sharing just a little earlier because I'm not as good right now yet at working with this cast. But I did want to just let you know a little bit about, um, about Dimitri and about the movie that he created. Um, as you all know, Dimitri is a shining light dad. Um, and the movie is a terrific balance between the mysterious and hopeful. My True Fairy Tale follows Angie Goodwin, a 17 year old who vanishes after a horrific accident in the close knit town of Gardenland, Florida. As the police, her family and friends search for her, she embarks on her own mysterious journey to save the world and fulfill her childhood fa fantasy of becoming a superhero. Angie discovers that she has incredible abilities and looks for ways to help everyone as those around her deal with her disappearance. Driven by his own deeply personal story of losing his young, young daughter to a car accident, writer-director Dimitri's De debut feature is a mystical and uplifting tragedy that reminds us that we all have the power to be our own superheroes if we embrace the power of love. Uh, Dimitri Gelfand is the producer of this beautiful movie and the shining light dad of Alyssa, who passed in a car crash on Memorial Day of 2017. Um, she was 17 years old, full of love and life, and suddenly vanished from his world. But then came this beautiful film. And so without further ado, I'd love to introduce all of you to Dimitri, who's here with us this evening. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me, Elizabeth. Irene, it's, it's really a pleasure to be here. Also, I would love for you to start out by telling us a little bit about your journey. First of all, if you could tell us about Alyssa and then tell us about um, after her passing, what led you to create this beautiful movie and a little bit about how it's changed your way of thinking about Alyssa's passing. Um. Very well. Um, I'm uh, going to try to give you a very short version because um, uh, there is a lot more to it, but I will try to compress it. Um, you know, I, I always put a big smile when I think about Alyssa because um, she was just um, light and love, as we say, every time she entered a room and every time uh, since the moment I can remember it. And you know, when she came to this world, she came also in a very mystical type of a way. When my ex-wife and I, we went to see a doctor, the doctor jokingly said, oh, you know, you're going to have uh, your baby 
on January 1st, 2000. And we sort of laughed and we thought, oh, well, you know, there must be some type of price with it. Well, guess what? She was born on January 1st, 2000. She was a millennium baby. And um, from the moment she was born, she was a um, traveler. She uh, notoriously called herself uh, that international kid. Um, she started off in Brooklyn where she was born. And then we moved to Los Angeles, then back to New York. And then uh, we wind up living for over five years in the Caribbean where Alyssa went to um, international school, uh, to be precise, in Aruba. And um, watching her um, from very beginning to the moment she passed, it was um, sometimes I asked myself this question, who is my daughter? Because there was something, something very, very special about her always. And I, and I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but um, I would always go and ask her for an advice. And I would always have a relationship with her um, as a friend, as a best friend. In fact, uh, she had names for everybody. My name was Twin. She called me a twin. And uh, um, uh, to make the long story short, after her, uh, uh, the Caribbean, when she finished her uh, eighth grade, the island life became a little bit too, too islandish for us. We, we, we sort of had an island fever and uh, yes. I was not happy with uh, what I was doing. I was not in the film world. Um, Alyssa was not uh, happy being stuck in a small island and she wanted to see something bigger. And uh, uh, my ex-wife also wanted to have a fresh start. And so three of us decided that we're going to move back to the United States. But because I no longer wanted to um, manage apartments and I wanted to fulfill my dream of being a filmmaker when I turned 40, um, uh, we had no idea what we're going to do. So um, uh, my parents, Alyssa's grandparents graciously agreed to uh, uh, see her for a year in New York while we settled in Seattle, Washington. And, you know, life, um, life has very interesting and mysterious way of working about it. And sometimes it throws curves, bolts at you. And uh, uh, sometimes they're fast, sometimes they're curved, but you sort of have to just uh, react to it. You have no choice. And uh, um, uh, my ex-wife and I, we decided to uh, go separate directions in life. Um, I dove into filmmaking and she decided to uh, continue on her journey. And uh, we decided uh, uh, to ask Alyssa what she would want to do. And uh, she wanted to finish her high school in upstate New York with her grandparents. And so um, I moved on to Los Angeles. My ex-wife stayed in Seattle and um, Alyssa stayed in New York. But that did not uh, uh, stop our relationship with Alyssa. And we saw each other quite a bit. We went on cruises together. In fact, Alyssa was very upset that she couldn't get to the 10th cruise. She had nine cruises under her belt, but just, just couldn't hit the 10th one. And I went with her on the ninth cruise and it was um, in the month of April, 2017, one month before it happened. And so um, that brings me to the month of uh, uh, May of 2017 when um, uh, the whole world uh, just flipped upside down for me, for my ex-wife, for uh, my parents, for entire uh, community here, and of course, Alyssa's friends. Um, one of my short films, by then I had about three years under my belt as a filmmaker, and I was very lucky to sell my second short film um, to PBS, and it was traveling around the country, and I was invited to have my um, film presented in Florida, in Naples. And I flew back to New York because uh, Alyssa wanted to see a college. Her and I, we 
sat in the car, in her car, and we drove to Syracuse University. This was her dream. She wanted to attend Syracuse University and study God, God knows what. And, uh, but she just um, felt that communications and something um, that had to do with entertainment would be her thing. But she just couldn't put it, quite put it what it was exactly because what she liked to do the best was to take care of people. And in fact, she had a nickname mommy because she would take care of all her friends all the time. And we had a wonderful chat um, on the way to Syracuse and a wonderful time in Syracuse. And that was uh, on May 10th. I flew back to Los Angeles and um, started putting my finishing touches on the pilot that I was writing to present to um, uh, several big platform networks. And uh, um, I wanted to make sure that I read the pilot to Alyssa because Alyssa really, it was a, a, a comedy and Alyssa really loved um, one of the uh, characters. And um, something really, really strange happened. I should uh, step back for a second and let you know that when, before I left for Los Angeles on May 13th, um, Alyssa had asked me to do something very strange. Um, or at least I felt that way. She came over to me with a DVD of my short film uh, called Shade of Music. And she asked me to sign an autograph for her. And I thought it was extremely silly. Um, and I didn't understand why she wanted this. And she wanted to put this in her box. But this, this struck me. I, I had a very negative tint about it. And I couldn't understand why. Um, and the day before I left, I remember she... Um, the girl who always smiled and the girl who always you looked at and said, oh my God, I want to take the pill she's taking. Why is she so happy all the time? She was crying and she hugged me. And she said, um, I just had a dream that you died. And, and of course I hugged her back and I said, this is silly. I'm here. Everything is fine. And um, those two things strike me as very, very odd right before I left for LA. But, you know, at the time when that happens, you tend to think, oh, it's, you know, it's just a flaw in the system, whatever it is, it's just, it, it's just a thing, it's just life. And then um, a day before her accident, I FaceTime her and um, the FaceTime lasted for less than 30 seconds. And I found her to be in a very dark place. Not that she was in a dark room, but it almost like she knew that something was about to happen. Again, it's less than 30 seconds. You, you know, you don't think much of it. The next day, it's a Memorial Day. It's uh, uh, May 28th. And um, that's when um, I get a phone call from my mother saying, you know, it's all, it's past nine o'clock and Alyssa hasn't come home yet. And oh my God, she's 17 years old and her license is gonna get suspended or something because she has to be home before nine o'clock. And I said, mom, she's absolutely fine. It's absolutely great. I still have to read her the pilot that I just wrote. Everything is gonna be fine. And she says, oh my God, there is a, there is a police car on the, on the driveway. I will call you back. And when she hangs up the phone, I started getting this strange feeling. Um, my, something started happening to my breathing, but I started calming myself down. This is, it's just fine. It's great. It's fine. Nothing. It's, it's, you know, Alyssa doesn't get into trouble. She's a good girl. Everything is going to be just fine. She's with two of her friends. It's okay. And then um, my mom calls me again and says, hey, um, we're on the way uh, to the hospital. There's been an accident. How bad is it? I say, uh, well, uh, we don't know. Mm, I am. And uh, this is where um, I start panicking a little bit. 
but um, I'm trying to remain calm, but I cannot uh, remain calm, obviously. And, uh, you know, I start smoking my cigarettes as I normally would when I get nervous. And then um, I decided I'm not going to call my mom because I, 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 I just, I, I, I want her to call me and, uh, um, um, and I couldn't. And so I called her back and she says, um, I, I cannot tell you anything. I think they're operating on her, but she's in an intensive care unit. Oh my God. And this is where um, the strange phenomena starts happening to me and the time starts to slow down or it goes into this wah, wah, wah kind of mode. And then I remember distinctly uh, the call that um, I got from my dad and said, hey, book your tickets and come home right now. And uh, um, I, I really literally don't know how to use my computer anymore. I, I don't know how to make the ticket because I, I understand that something is not right. And I, like my hands are not moving. I don't know what's going on with me. I, it's just like, I'm in this different space, uh, dimension. And then uh, that call that my mom uh, makes and says, um, hey, we, we don't have Alyssa anymore. <sighs> when that call comes in, I, I didn't scream, I didn't cry, I started to hyperventilate. I, I couldn't understand, it couldn't fit with me. And I still hasn't booked, I haven't booked my ticket. Um, and I said, well, what do you mean? This cannot be, this cannot be. Somehow, some way I managed to book a ticket and I was on the uh, red light, uh, red eye flight from Los Angeles to upstate New York, the same night on the way there. And as I was driving in the Uber, everything was moving in a slow motion. I, I didn't know, I, I was still in, 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 this, in this space, place where it was like being in the vacuum. And I had to call my ex-wife and I had to tell her what had happened. And of course she did not take it very well. And uh, I told her that she needs to book tickets and fly to uh, New York. And then when I sat on the plane, something really, really strange happened. I had this thought of, ah, I hope this plane crashes. I'm okay. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't care anymore. And all of a sudden on my left hand, I started feeling a sort of like a paperweight on my left hand. And I said, oh, great. Now I'm getting a heart attack. Great, that's wonderful. Great, good, maybe I'll die here right now. And the same paperweight, all of a sudden, I felt on my right hand. And I said, well, that, that cannot be right. If the left hand is the heart, then what is the right hand then? And I have to tell you that um, I, um, I, I've read a lot of esoterica before, prior to this. I have read a lot of uh, mystical books. And uh, if there was one fascination and one hobby that I had was a fascination with uh, near-death experiences and um, um, philosophies of various religions and theologies. Uh, in fact, I spent uh, the last five months prior to moving back to the States, um, waking up at five in the morning and studying um, esoterica, um, which included, ironically, uh, books by somebody like Ibn Alexander, Ibn Alexander, Proof of Heaven. And uh, um, when I arrived to New York, I... Um, started to experience everything that, that people show in the films, everything that you read in the books. I started to experience something that I cannot even describe to you. And I, you, you, because you would have to actually feel it. 
And there was still a chance that she would be okay because apparently she wasn't gone or they didn't um, disconnect her. She was still in the hospital. And when I walked in the room and I saw her, she looked as peaceful as it could be. And surprisingly, there was no hematoma. There was no bleeding internally, nothing. She had a little scratch on her foot. What had happened was her brain separated from her spinal cord. And um, there was nothing they could do. And after the state exam was made, she was um, really pronounced a brain dead. And when I was going those two days sleeping at the house, I started to experience the electricity, the lights, and I could tell you them all in, uh, in more details, but I knew she was present. And I had this dialogue with her in my mind where I said, you make a decision. It's your call. And uh, whatever the decision that you make, I'm here for you and I will always be here for you. And I felt that feeling again, that feeling of a paperweight on my hand. And I'm not gonna lie to you, I broke down alone when nobody saw me. And on the third day of breaking down and after uh, there was nothing we could do and we had to pronounce her um, dead, I was taking a shower and this very strange idea came to me that I have to bring her back. And the only way I could bring her back is by writing her back. I have to go on a journey and I have to find her. And the only way I know how to do it is through what I do, is to tell a story. But I cannot tell a story about what happened and exactly about every single person as they are. I have to make this film for her, not about her, for her and from her, how she would want the story to be told. But it's absolutely absurd because the only thing that was popping into my head was to make a happy tragedy. But there is no such a thing as a happy tragedy. And things just start to happen in an incredible, incredible way. What I wanted to do first was to become part of her gang. I wanted to become part. I wanted to become the friend that was missed. I wanted to be her now with her friends. So I made sure I got to know every single one of her closest friends and spend time with them. Still not knowing how the story is gonna go, how it's going to um, um, manifest itself. And at the same time, um, uh, nothing was coming into my head. How would I even be able to tell the story? And please keep in mind that I'm only human and I needed to see mediums as well. I needed to go see Akashic readers as well. I needed some answers and I was a grieving dead. And on a human level, I still am, even though Alyssa and I are closer right now than ever before. And pieces of proof one by one started coming. And I remember when I went to see an Akashic reader, I was sitting at 7-Eleven and all of a sudden, this word of fairy tale came to me. And the first monologue of the film, ever since I was a little girl, I had this dream. One day I become a fairy tale of my true, of, of, of my own very own fairy tale. I could fly, be invisible, and at the end save the world. And I wrote it down and I knew this was my starting point. And um, 
there I went and I, um, I gave you a very, very uh, short version, missing so many things. And uh, that's how I got to start to write the script. I wrote the script in uh, three and a half uh, months, total three and a half months. It took me about, uh, I would say five months total, but uh, three and a half of actual writing time. Um, and um, algorithmically, the script was written really, was, I'm not going to say was dictated by Alyssa, but it was completely influenced and completely, um, so many things were given to me by Alyssa and so many um, hidden messages and um, um, things that are in the script was Alyssa's doing. And um, uh, then miraculously, um, I wind up making this film and uh, miraculously this film is now available everywhere and I am just um, just just incredibly um, grateful and thankful and um, yeah. Well, we are as well and I can tell you that this movie again, I it's beautiful. It's beautifully made. It's so, um, it's almost like you're, you're seeing it as a dream, but these, these kids are beautiful. The relationships with their, their parents, everything is just so, uh, beautifully done. Um, I would say that the characters are, are amazing. I, I think that the girl that I think her name is Angie in the film, who you must have chosen to play Alyssa. She is just, she's got so much personality and what a great choice to have um, as the person who's representing her. But I wanna go back really quickly to what you were saying about the fact that um, Alyssa was, was seeming like she was in a dark place the last time that you spoke to her. I think that's fascinating because I think that a lot of us have um, a very good idea that our kids are going to transition because they they know themselves that they're going to transition. And again, I always tell people that the day before Morgan went back to China, he told me that he didn't think as we're packing his suitcase, he didn't think he was coming back again. And I said, you don't have to go. You, you can stay here. You, you can be with us and you don't even need those credits. And he said, no, I'll be fine. And I have a feeling from what I'm hearing from you that it was similar to what Alyssa was feeling. She was getting that signature from you on that CD. She realized that she was going to be transitioning but I don't think that she was afraid of it. I think that you probably interpreted your own, gosh, what's happening as fear. But I think that when our kids are ready to go, they are not at all. There's no fear at all involved. And mostly because they are very happy, healthy, and whole where, where they are. I also think it's fascinating that you are already reading these esoteric but I would say more metaphysical books about Evan Alexander and other authors that we all, of course, um, read even before anything happened with Alyssa, right? So this was long before, before you were moving to the States that you were reading all of these books. Is that correct? Uh, that is absolutely correct. Um, uh, in fact, my... Um... My, my path to metaphysical studies started from when I turned 26, when someone recommended me uh, to read a book of Osho. And um, uh, Osho really started me on the journey um, of the uh, metaphysical studies. And um, uh, um, being born uh, a Jew, uh, living in the Soviet Union and then immigrating, I had no religion. And so of course I wanted to, to know the, what all religions are, but it was always 
I'm, I, I want to say not enough. I wanted to seek more. I wanted to seek more. I wanted to get to the bottom of it. I wanted to seek the truth. What is the ultimate truth? And really that's what drove me. But um, uh, nothing prepares you for the, um, let's say inciting incident, something like this that happened to Alyssa. And then um, it all sort of comes into, into focus when, um, um, you're, you, you sort of um, become summoned as a hero to your own tale, as Joseph Campbell puts it, and you have to go on and take that journey on your own. Um, and uh, uh, you have no choice because you have to do it. And uh, certainly at that moment, you have to take a very drastic decision because uh, it's something drastic that happens. And that decision could go either dark or it could go light. And I figured uh, since I could always take a darker path and I could always get into drugs, I could always get into alcohol, I will try a completely different path. And in fact, uh, um, I'm here to tell you it worked for me. Um, I've stopped smoking the same day. I've never picked up a cigarette again. Um, I've uh, stopped eating meat. Not because, uh, of course, I don't want the animals to be hurt, but um, through a medium, through a very brilliant medium, Stacy Jones, um, uh, Alyssa came and she said that uh, it would be better to connect with me if you probably did not eat meat. I stopped eating meat, so I have not done it. <laughs> and um, I started uh, religiously meditating um, um, almost uh, every day, two times, starting at 5 a.m. in the morning. And uh, um, it all started to, uh, to come together and I started to um, follow the signs and I started to uh, align with um, the things that were coming because um, as uh, Suzanne Giesman brilliantly puts it, there are setups and these setups, they work in brilliant ways. And I, um, and I was no exception because um, our kids make those setups for us. And I'm here witness to tell you it's absolutely true. And uh, um, every step of the way, looking back um, up to this day, it's still going on. That's amazing. So Sherry's saying, amazing. Your daughter is so proud of you, which I think we all believe. And I can't wait for everyone to see the movie if they haven't. But I also want to just uh, understand then when you started meditating and when you started maybe not eating as much meat and, you know, not smoking, was that when you started having this deep connection with Alyssa that who, who actually helped you to write this film? So was it during that creative process um, or could you that's tell a, a bit more? That's a terrific question. I, you know, um, Without lying, I will tell you, I um, I was superhuman, uh, especially um, several months after this happened, and uh, um, very vulnerable. And I was I was still eating meat. Uh, I wasn't smoking because I just quit the same moment this this happened. Um, you know, in fact, in Los Angeles, colon, I've never picked up a cigarette since, and. Um, um, I went to see, as I told you before, I went to see a brilliant um, medium, uh, Stacy Jones in uh, New Jersey. And uh, um, to book with Stacy, you need to wait six months, but somehow it worked out that she was able to see me. And she allowed me to record the, 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 uh, uh, the session. And when, um, and, and I thought Alyssa came through nicely and it's, and I wanted to share the session uh, with my mother and she did not want to listen to it because it was way too hard for her. And I, and I said, well, you should listen to it. It's very lighthearted. And as I started listening to the session, I heard the voice of Alyssa on one of the answers. And I couldn't believe my ears what I was hearing. It was her pitch. And it was exactly her, and I knew it. <laughs> Call me crazy. I took everything that Stacey told me as dogma. All 99% of what she had said happened. 
99% of it. And one of those things was you should, if you want to connect quicker, you should stop eating meat. <laughs> and that's a long answer of how I stopped eating meat, being very honest with you. Well, it's a good idea, I think. Um, it, it does raise our vibration. Not that I would ever tell someone that they have to stop eating meat, but I don't. And I haven't for years and years and years. And I think that that is a good way to get to throw ourselves into it. But I just want to ask you, because I find the film to be so beautiful. Um, does does uh, Alyssa have that relationship in um, in real life? Was she really close friends with two? Oh, well, there were uh, three friends, but she must have been the person who uh, what who who told everyone else what to do and and took care of everyone else is is that exactly the way that she is that's that's exactly the way she was again um a lot of her friends called her mommy because uh she would take care of them she would be the designated driver she would pick up uh them at school because she had car and uh and, you know, she would always uh, make presents for them and put them in the nice bags and write nice notes. And uh, um, she just liked to take care of people. Um, as far as the relationships and the characters in the film, um, they are inspired by true events uh, and by, by true personalities, but it is a fiction. For example, let's not go far away and say that my relationship in the film is um, was not the way it is in real life. Uh, am I classically trained pianist? Yes, I am. Did I write a couple of themes in the film? I did, but I it, my goal was never to become a filmmaker, and I By never. By the way, had. those are beautiful, beautiful oh. songs too. I I I mean, I think that anyone who does appreciate piano um, is going to love those songs. They were. Sorry, and and given to you by Alyssa, or yeah, by Alyssa in the movie, it, by Angie, obviously, which was really cool. So, sorry. And, and, and I have to, and, and I have to say that uh, Apancho uh, Burgos, uh, my composer, he helped me drive them home, and he wrote, he really wrote this score, magnificent, magnificent score, and. I, I just, my head goes off to him because he really did uh, get the essence of it. Um, but as far as all the characters in the film, every single one of them came up with their own names, by the way. So I didn't have to, I came up with a name for Angie because it's Angel, it's uh, Alyssa and it's an A. Um, I came up obviously for a character who was inspired by me and everybody else all her friends came up with the names of the teen characters. Now, there was a lot more stories, to be honest with you. And some of the stories we couldn't fit in the film. And some of the stories we had to cut just because the way it was manifesting itself. And uh, um, so a lot of characters was a, a, a hybrid, again, inspired by the fantasy part of it and the way Angie in the film was really personified of what Alyssa was and what her nature is. That's beautiful. And also, I just was wondering, um, obviously you have family members represented in the movie. Um, how did your wife and your parents and everyone else, uh, how do they identify with it? Um, did they fall in love with it? Do they believe? Is it something that they um, have a hard time with? Um, could you maybe talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. Um, uh, and again, that's, that's a terrific question. Um, you know, I think it's very important to... Uh, um, to mention that when um, something like this happens, there is a certain grieving process. And when this grieving process happens, everyone grieves differently. And I think it's very important that um, we respect each and everyone's grieving process. Um, my ex-wife 
uh, decided not to be part of this project. And uh, um, she didn't feel that uh, this would somehow, some way, um, uh, make her feel better. And I had to respect that decision and I had to uh, uh, stay away from that. Um, that said, um, the storyline, I don't want to give it away, but the storyline with Alyssa's, oh, excuse me, with Angie's uh, mother in a film is inspired by true events as well. Um, it helped quite a bit to my parents and it sort of set them to normalcy if, 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 if there is such a thing, but more or less they're able to uh, cope with it and feel that she's present with them because she spent the last three years of her life living most of the time with them. Um, as far as the kids, uh, the majority of them reached out to me and um, sent me embraces and love for bringing her back to life and uh, saying that, how did you know how? And I said, it, it was just about the feeling. I didn't know how, it was the feeling and I went with the feeling and um, yeah. I was wondering about the kids too, because yes, um, being able to see something like this and feel that there's not only closure, but actually beautiful closure because this, this movie just makes everybody feel so uplifted. Um, I'm sure that it must have been a godsend for them to be able to have this and to attend it. And I hope that all of you were able to go to the opening night together so that you could all uh, laugh and cry together. Um, was that a possibility or was it since it was COVID, it probably happened in individual homes all by yourselves, right? <laughs> um, unfortunately, the, the, the timing for the uh, film couldn't be any worse with COVID. Um, and at the same time, um, it couldn't be any better. It was everything is in the right timing. And uh, um, uh, frankly speaking, uh, we did not know that a major uh, distribution company would pick this film up um, and make it available nationally. We, we did not expect this. Of course, uh, my goal from the beginning was, I hope um, as many people as possible get to see Alyssa's, uh, the story that Alyssa was able to transcend through me. Um, and that's exactly what happened. But we didn't know. And so to answer your question, we were not able to do that. Um, uh, we, the only screening in person that we were able to have was uh, in Iowa, where um, the film was nominated for uh, uh, the best of picture at the Julien de Buc uh, International Film Festival. That's so exciting. You know, again, when you first contacted me, I, I thought, oh, a movie, how nice. And I said to Irene, oh, we, we should watch this movie, especially since this is a shining light dad, but I wasn't expecting, I, and again, even, even halfway through it, I was still thinking, is this gonna be what I really want to see in a movie about one of our kids who's transitioned? And it, it turned out to be that and more. It was, it was just such a beautiful, a beautiful way to spend a few hours, but, but more importantly, something that could serve as a launching pad for a lot of parents who are deep in their grief to understand that all of our kids are superheroes and all of our kids can do whatever they want to now. Can you tell us a little bit about, oh, let's see, Carmen is asking, where can we view the movie? Could you tell us about the easiest options to see um, My True Fairy Tale? Um, let's see, Anne Babette is asking, what 
what Alyssa is communicating to you now after the movie, but let's start with maybe uh, it's, it's available on YouTube. I know that it's available a lot of different places. I'm going to type the name of the movie here. So do you know of the best places to be able to see it? Because uh, we have a lot of people who are in uh, Canada, in the UK, um, places that don't necessarily do Amazon Prime. Is it on? It's on Amazon Prime as well. Is that right? It should be available on Rogers as well in Canada. But um, unfortunately, uh, you know, the rights of the film um, have been acquired by Gravitas Ventures. It's a distribution company. And um, uh, it, in the United States, it's available on more than 22 platforms. So any platform, Fandango, um, uh, Prime, uh, uh, I don't know, any the uh, Google Play, um, Apple, uh, what, whichever one you could think of, it's, it's available on Vudu. Um, uh, as far as this going to another country, um, yes, uh, it will. Uh, I think it has to take a 90 day, don't, don't kill a messenger, please. Uh, it, it may, it probably takes 90 days before they uh, will uh, release it uh, to another country. Um, and there is a possibility that, um, a very likely possibility that it will go to a bigger platform, like a accessible platform. We're talking about uh, really, really big platforms. And I don't want to say any names in, uh, in several months as well. That's exciting. Goodness gracious. Well, that would be wonderful. Um, so Andrea is asking, when, uh, when your daughter was an infant, were you very protective of her? And also, do you feel that she is an old soul? Great question. Um, no, I felt that uh, she was protecting me. Um, very strangely. In fact, um, I confess, I, I asked her for business advice when she was 13 years of age, when um, I was uh, living in the Caribbean. Um, so yeah. Um, and uh, what is the other part of the question? Um, well, oh, the old soul. Uh, no, yeah. I, don't believe, I don't believe she was an old soul. Before I would answer that question, yes. But now um, I'm very, very certain, um, especially after um, um, going through a lot of uh, studies and meditating um, and the things that uh, um, Kabbalah talks about and Dolores uh, Cannon, uh, she is a, um, what they call a new wave, new wave of uh, souls that come in to, um, uh, to show us something new. And, um, to teach us something and then uh, they make um, their exit. Yeah. I love the new wave uh, and Andrea saying beautifully said, thank you. Um, we didn't get to answer the one that Babette asked. Um, what is she communicating to you now after the movie? Have you gotten any messages from her since? Yes. Um, now she's telling me what those holding my hands from the very beginning. Remember I told you how I felt the paperweight. It was her holding my hand. And now um, she tells me what that meant. And that meant, I'm gonna walk you through it. I'm gonna walk you through it. And um, you can do this. And so that's probably the biggest thing. That's beautiful. We have one of our board members who, that was one of the big things that happened to him right after his son passed in a car accident. He was sitting in the hospital room and felt the pressure of his son's hands on him. And he turned his hand over and held his son's hand. And he said he's never in his life felt a hand as soft as his son's. Um, and so he knew it was Quentin. So um, 
that when you were talking about the pressure on your hands in the airplane, I just thought, oh my gosh, of course it's Alyssa just telling you that she's there with you. I also wanted to ask if you think that, and if you've heard, I know you, you talked about near-death experiences. Do you think that you experienced a shared death experience with Alyssa when she transitioned? Ooh, um... I'd like to think so. Uh, you know, it's um, it, it's a very, very uh, a strange moment um, because um, I'm going to use a very strange word. Um, I'm going to use the word possession. Um, another epiphany. The, the day after she passed also happened to me in the shower. And I almost got something entered me because the whole community was in a disarray. My parents didn't know what to do. My ex-wife did not know what to do. Um, we had to, but we had to do a funeral. And I made a very, very crazy decision because I felt that this what was being communicated to me. I said, there's not going to be any bodies in the funeral. And we're not going to any cemeteries afterwards. More than anything in the world, Alyssa wanted to celebrate her 18th birthday. And what we're going to do after the funeral home, we're gonna go and we're going to celebrate her 18th birthday, everyone. And my dad's business partner opened one of the best restaurants to everyone. And that's what we did. And so I, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I think in that way, I shared that transition with her because I always wanted to come from her space and how she would want this. She must be so proud of you. Oh my gosh. Just, just being able to have this beautiful movie out there, first of all, to have her dad who's so in tune with her, listening to what she's saying, and she'll be with you for the rest of your life. She's going to be your biggest advocate, your biggest cheerleader. And um, it's very exciting that you have this piece of work that not only helps you and her, but also helps so many other people throughout the world. Not, it, it doesn't even have to be someone who's had a child transition. It can be anyone um, who will be helped by this movie. So hopefully everyone will be able to find it. We have about six minutes later, or uh, six minutes left. Um, and I wanted to ask you if you have some things that you'd like to tell us that we haven't been able to get to um, in, in this hour. Um, we have, you know, I think that people are so transfixed by what you're saying that they're not necessarily asking a lot of questions, but it's just beautiful to hear you speak. So do you have some parting words of wisdom for us for as uh, helping parents heal? Um, you know, when, um, first of all, thank you very much. I, I try to speak uh, from my heart. And um, um, as a film director, um, I always concentrate on the feeling. Um, what, how do I want people to feel? And um, as a writer, it's a little bit different because I was a grieving dad and I was writing my way to find Alyssa again. And as I was writing the script, I slowly started to realize that the story is a little bit bigger than just about Alyssa and just about finding her. And um, it is a little bit bigger than just um, uh, you know, love conquers all. And um, ironically, even the title, My True Fairy Tale, it's the film is really about you and you meaning I, 
it's all of us because um, we are uh, the heroes of our own fairy tale. And it is up to us to make this story the way we want to make it. And um, something, this incredible, tragic, and at the same time, so awakening happens to you, it summons you. It literally orders you to go on that journey and you have to take that journey and you have to take it through a dark and deep forest uh, and the road is not paved, but you take it and it just, it just, it takes you there. And it's absolutely incredible and mystical how everything, how the trees will part and how things will manifest for you or at least they did for me. And it's just simply magical and mystifying experience. They will for all of us because our kids are all working as a group. They have a lot of help up there as well. I just wanna read some of the comments. Uh, Diane is saying, I'm watching tonight, just ordered on Prime. Iris is saying, so heartfelt. I can't wait to watch the movie, thank you. Valentina is saying, what a great story. Gives me shivers, thank you so much. Um, Anne is saying, this may just have changed my direction. Thank you. And I just want you to know that, um, that it, it, we're, we're, of course, thrilled to have you here. Um, someday, it would be wonderful to have you uh, come and show the movie at some point when it's possible. Obviously, it's not possible, probably through whoever owns it right now and then talk about it after but this was this this was the next best thing and i also want to let people know who are on here i think irene weinberg is still on here with us and she's going to be interviewing dimitri uh next week yes, yes i am yes so here she is she's here i am dimitri <laughs> hi so i'm very Yes, so uh, as you know, Irene um, wrote the book, They Serve Bagels in Heaven, but she also has an incredible podcast and Dimitri will be on that. So any of the questions that were unanswered today, you'll be able to hear more about Dimitri on that, on that podcast. And thank you all for being here. We just appreciate it so much. And um, we always allow everyone to unmute and say thank you and goodbye at the end of the meeting. So Irene, is it ready? Yes. It's ready. Yes, it thank is. you so much. <laughs> and goodbye from my heart. And to be continued. <laughs> thank you. Thank yes. you. Watch the movie. It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful movie. movie. Thank, thank you so much. So much. Thank, thank you, Jimmy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank thank you. you. Thank and well, thanks for your heart so much for for interviewing Dimitri. You'll love him, obviously. And thank oh. you all for being here. <laughs> Bye, Bye, everybody. That's hey. wonderful. Irene, good to see you too. Thank you. Yes, hi, Irene. Bye, everyone. Bye, -bye. Bye for now. Bye.